This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Hello, everyone. <laughs> OK. I want to continue with our development of the properties of the discrete Fourier transform, picking up a little bit on where we left off last time and then uh, indicating some things that are going to come next time. So this is getting to know your DFT better. And again, the subtext to this, if I can use that expression, is that you already know your DFT pretty well because we're trying to make things in the discrete case look as much as possible as things in the continuous case. All right? So the same formulas, the same intuition, and so on carry over. There are differences that I've already pointed out, some, and will continue to point out, but I'd say there are probably more similarities than there are differences. All right, so let me remind you of the basic definitions. You start out with a discrete signal, which I'm writing in this form. So you can think of it as an n-tuple of n numbers. And the discrete Fourier transform of this, and I uh, take the discrete complex exponentials, they are the essential building blocks to this complex exponentials. That's omega is um, the nth component is, or the, yeah, is e to the minus 2 pi, uh, these, ah, geez, 2 pi i over n. I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. e to the minus 2 pi i n over m, there we go. And the discrete Fourier transform is a combination of these. The Fourier transform of f is sum from n equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of the components of the input times the powers of this discrete complex exponential, omega to the minus n. This should be plus, sorry. I take a minus power. No, oh, that's right. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, I'll leave it like that. There we go. OK. You raise it to the minus power. I was, I was confusing the, 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 the uh, forward Fourier transform with the inverse Fourier transform. So the mth component is, can we cut the tape and let me start over again here? The nth component of this is sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of fn e to the minus 2 pi i n m over n. That's an m. OK. All right, we are set. And um, I remind you of the, of, the, of the important property of the discrete exponential that makes so much um, happen. In the discrete case, that's the orthogonality. So the orthogonality of the discrete complex exponentials says that if I take the kth power of omega and take the inner product with the lth power of omega, that's either equal to 0 if k is different from l, or it's equal to n if k is equal to l. And here, the appearance of the, of the constant n is the source of so much pain and suffering with a discrete Fourier transform because of the way it enters into various formulas. In particular, it enters into the definition of the inverse discrete Fourier transform, which looks like this, is 1 over n times the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 fn times um, omega to the plus n, all right? So it looks, the dis inverse discrete Fourier transform looks almost like the discrete Fourier transform with a plus sign instead of a minus sign and with this extra factor of 1 over n out front. And again, that always comes from, wherever it appears, it always comes ultimately, derives ultimately from this property of the um, discrete complex exponentials. OK, now, um, let me do some, let me, let, me, let me compute some special transforms for you that come up that are, again, analogous to the continuous case, all right? Let's do some special cases. For one thing, what is the value of the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, at 0? The Fourier transform of f at 0 is the sum from n equals 0 up to capital N minus 1 of fn times omega to the minus n at 0 
its component at zero. That is, it's just the sum from n equals zero to uh, capital N minus one of <coughs> fn times one. The, the, z the zeroth component of any power of omega is always one. The first component is, the zeroth component is either the two pi i zero, uh, which is one. So it's just the sum of the entries. Sum from n equals zero to n minus one of fn. All right, that's analogous to the zero, the value of the Fourier transform at zero is the integral of the function, which you can think of as sort of the sum of all the entries. All right, so it's analogous to to the Fourier transform of f at zero is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of t dt. Isn't that nice? That's one thing, and it comes up, that comes up often enough that you should know it, or makes, take, take note of it. Next, um, let me introduce two special signals that also come up that are also analogous to the classical case, or the continuous case, around there. Two special signals, discrete signals. One is one. That is to say, the constant function, constant signal one. Now, so I'll indicate that with an underline under it. So that's the signal with all ones, familiar to you from MATLAB, among other things. And the other is the discrete delta function. So the discrete delta would be, well, again, I can, I can distinguish between the delta that's, say, centered at zero and centered at a point k. So the delta function centered at zero, if I'm writing it as an n-tuple, index from zero to n minus one, I put a zero in the first slot, I, excuse me, I put a one in the first slot and zeros everywhere else. First slot. And the delta, the shifted delta function, discrete delta function, say shifted to k, has zero, zeros every place except in the kth slot where it has a one. So delta sub k is zero everywhere except in the kth slot where it has a one and zeros every place else. So the good news is we don't have to do rapidly decreasing functions. We don't have to do generalized functions. We don't have to do any of that stuff. It's just simply defined to be a discrete signal with one in one space and zero in the other places. Now, what is the analog to the continuous case? It's pretty nice. Let's look at the Fourier transform of the delta function at zero. What do you get? Well, you have no recourse here but to compute according to the definition, and here the definition is very straight, applies in a very straightforward way. This would be the sum from n equals zero to n minus one of the delta function at m, the nth, excuse me, the nth component of the delta function times omega to the minus n. And the delta function, the nth component of the delta function, or the components of the delta function, are zero except in the very first slot. Remember, delta zero at n is just the nth component, so the zeroth component, the first component, the second component, and so on. So this is just one times omega to the zero. Omega to the zero is the zeroth power of omega, that is one, one, all the way one discrete signal consisting of all ones. That is to say, it is the constant signal one. All right? No distributions, no, you know, sort of any of that stuff. It, it, it falls out immediately from the definition, and it is exactly analogous to the continuous case. Aren't we pleased to see that? The Fourier transform of the delta function is one. That's why I introduced this notation, you know, except with the underlines here, to make it look as much like the continuous case as possible. The discrete case looks like the con continuous case. Your intuition in the one case carries over to your intuition in the discrete case, except for the occasional irritating appearance of a factor capital N, or one over N, depending on which way it goes. All right, likewise, what is the Fourier transform of the shifted delta function? Well, again, you have no recourse here other than to work with the definition. So the Fourier transform of the shifted delta function 
is the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of the shifted delta function, its nth component, times omega to the minus n. And again, the only term that survives here is, yeah, you have a question? Slot over there? No, it's a k <coughs> slot. So delta 1, well, you have to be careful how you're indexing here from 0 to n minus 1. Right. All right. They just have to from 0 to This is a 0. Oh, no, the, the one on the rightmost board. Pardon me? The one on the rightmost board. You said delta 0. Oh, well, oh, geez. Yeah. First slot, zero slot, okay. Yeah. So picky. <laughs> zero slot. Let me tell you, I'm gonna come, actually, I'm going to come back to this point. Um, perhaps you've heard me complain every now and then about the notation in this subject, you know, and the problem with writing variables. Well, the corresponding complaint in the discrete case, not exactly corresponding, but generating just as much invective, is uh, the question of indexing. All right. Indexing for the discrete Fourier transform is, as they say in the business, a royal pain in the ass. You know, it is just a pain in the ass. And uh, I will explain, however, how you can get around this little pain in the ass. And it is not as much a pain in the ass as it could be. And here when they release this tape to the public, it's frantically bleeping things here. Um, but nevertheless, whether you index, we index and it's natural to index when you're first talking about it from 0 to n minus 1, but not, that's not the only scheme that's possible and it's not the only scheme in use. But to explain that, I have to do a little bit more. All right, I have to give you a little more background. Now, where was I before you so rudely interrupted? <clears throat> All right, I was going to compute the Fourier transform of the delta function shifted to k. What is it now? So again, the delta function, uh, the nth component of the, this, this delta function is 0 except in the kth slot where it's equal to 1. So the only, the only term that remains in this sum is when n is equal to k, and so that is uh, um, 1 times omega to the minus k. That is just omega to the minus k. This is not a dot as in dot product or anything, it's just 1 times that. All right, so what is the formula? Let's not lose sight of this. The formula is the Fourier transform of the shifted delta function is omega to the minus k. So again, think about that. That's, the, that's exactly analogous to the continuous case, where the Fourier transform of the shifted delta function is e to the minus 2 pi i s t, whatever it is. You know, I'm not going to say it because I'll probably say it wrong. But it's the same result. All right, it's the same result. So again, that's a case where your intuition carries over from the continuous case to the discrete case with the, with the appropriate choice of notation. It's nice, right? We, we should be pleased to see that. Okay. Now, what about the other way that is going from, what about the Fourier transform of the complex exponentials? What about the Fourier transform of 1 and the Fourier transform of omega to the k? Well, let's work that out. Let's work out the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform of omega to the k. Again, we have no recourse here. We don't have duality yet, although we will. The Fourier transform of omega to the k in terms of the definition is the sum from n equals 0 to the n minus 1 of omega to the k, the nth component of that times omega to the minus n, okay? Now, let me write this out a little bit more. I have to work on this a little bit more just to see what falls out. What is the, say, mth component of that? I'll put in a little bit more notation here. So the mth component is the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of omega to the k, the nth component, times omega to the minus n, the nth component of that. All right, let me write these. Now, I could just put a little switcheroo here in terms of the notation, but let me write these out in terms of the ordinary exponential, that is e to the something or other. So this is, I'm not going to have quite enough room here. This is... The sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of e to the, uh, so omega to the k, the nth, com the nth component of that is e to the plus 2 pi i n k over capital N, right? And omega to the minus n, the nth component of that is e to the minus 
2 pi i m n over n. Okay? All right. So, you should recognize this as computing an inner product. All right? You should recognize this as computing the um, inner product of omega to the k with omega to the m. This, that is, you should recognize that the orthogonality of the discrete exponentials is coming in here. So you could recognize this as computing the inner product of omega to the k with omega to the m. All right? The sum is here over n, and the other, the other uh, variables that are in here are the kth variable uh, are k and m. So it's, it, this, this computation is, is the computation of the inner product of omega to the k with omega to the m. That is to say, it's equal to it's equal to 0 if k is different from m, and it's equal to n if k is equal to m. All right? That's the, remember, that's the mth component of the Fourier transform of omega to the k. All right? So let's write that down again here. The mth component of omega to the k, the Fourier transform of omega to k, is either equal to 0 if k is different from m, or equal to n if k is equal to m, and so we recognize that as n is n times 1. In other words, it's n times the delta function shifted to, pardon me? Somebody say something? Shifted to k. That is, this is equal to n times the delta function centered at k, shifted to k. Okay, let me write it down again, we'll write, write down the summary. That is to say, the Fourier transform of omega to the k is delta k. Oops. If it were only so nice, if it were only so nice, but it's not, there's an n in there. OK. So here's a case where it's almost analogous to the continuous case, but not quite, because there's that extra factor coming in. What can you do? Nothing. All right. These are three special cases that are, that are nice to see. We've seen the Fourier transform of the delta function is 1. The Fourier transform of the, is the constant, constant signal 1, discrete signal 1. The Fourier transform of delta k is somewhere up there. Omega to the minus k. All right. That's all fine. That's all directly analogous to the continuous case. To the, uh, continuous case. And then finally, the Fourier transform of the power of the complex exponential is n times the shifted delta function. So again, analogous to the classical case, but the analogy doesn't quite, is not quite exact. It's cute. No, it's very nice. These calculations, the kind of calculations that I just did here, are the kind of things you have to get used to doing, all right? Writing down the formula, understanding that you're working with discrete signals, when to evaluate it a component, you know, when to, when to bring in the sort of formula for the complex exponentials, what to recognize. I mean, there's a lot of little things along the way. As I said, when, when we were studying this, you just have to get used to it a little bit. Doing, some, doing a certain number of problems and sort of just being steeped in it for a while, you'll see it's not hard. It's just kind of, uh, just takes a little getting used to. Okay. All right, now, before I, there are a number of other general properties that I want to develop at the DFT, but before doing that, I want to, well, I want to take a slightly different perspective on it. We'll come back to this a little later, but I wanted to mention it now. So it's a slightly different perspective. Same form, but I would say on the definition, DFT, or certainly on the computation of the DFT, or at least on computation. That is to say, you can view the DFT, and in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's helpful to view the DFT as a matrix. You can view the DFT as an n by n matrix. That is to say, the process of computing the, the discrete Fourier transform of a given discrete signal is the process of matrix multiplication. So computing FF is matrix multiplication. 
all right? I could have taken this tack at the beginning, and in some cases it is taken at the beginning, but again, it's one of these, it's a different, it's a slight, it's the same thing, but it's a slightly different point of view, and as in many cases in the subject, you have to be able to go back and forth between different points of view. Now, why is this? So again, let me just write down the definition and just look at it a little bit differently. That's all that's involved. So the Fourier transform of F, the mth component of the Fourier transform of F, all right, is the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of my sum over the inputs of um, omega to the n, the mth component of that, to the minus n of that. Now, let me write this a little bit differently. I could write this in terms of, just to, just to save chalk, I could, I could write this as, we know what this is, omega to the minus n m, the mth component of that is, once again, e to the minus 2 pi i n m over n. Okay? So just to save a little writing, and it's actually quite a common notation, let me, let me write this a little bit differently, and I have to be careful here to distinguish between my scalars and my vectors. So let me write little omega, the scalar, not the vector, for the primitive nth root of unity. So let me write omega, so no underline, this is a scalar, so I'm sorry, this is, this is where it gets a little tough to distinguish sometimes between the two cases. This is um, uh, e to the 2 pi i over n, all right, so that's the nth root of unity, primitive nth root of unity. You have seen this notation before, we used this notation way back in the first problem set. It's a very standard notation, some people call it capital W, some people call it little w, but it's, it's quite common just to call this omega if you've got to call it something. So. Um, Omega to the minus nm is actually what, I'm, what comes up in this sum here, is e to the minus 2 pi i nm divided by n. And the Fourier transform looks like the Fourier transform looks like sum from n equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of, let me write it like this, omega to the minus nm times fn. Okay? Now, if you, write, if you write it that way, it appears as matrix multiplication. Okay? That is computing Computing the Fourier transform of F is to multiply, is multiplying by, keep my tenses straight here, multiplying by the matrix omega to the minus nm. You know what I mean by that, the matrix whose, whose nmth entry is omega to the minus nm. I'll write it out. Um, that is, let's do it like this. Here's the signal F0 down to Fn minus 1 as a column vector. And then what do I multiply to get the output? Well, the first, the zeroth component is I get 1's all the way across the top. Then I get, and, and it's actually symmetric, but I won't, I won't worry about that right now. Then 1 omega, oops, 1, omega to the minus 1, omega to the minus 2, Going back to omega to the n minus 1, that's in the first row, the row tagged with the index 1. This is the row tagged with the index 0, 1. The next row would be 1, omega to the minus 2, omega to the minus 4, omega to the minus 2, n minus 1, down to 1. And then this, the next one, well, I'll do one more row. 1, omega to the minus 3, omega to the minus 2 times 3, omega to the minus 3 times n minus 1. The bottom row would be 1, let me, get out, let me write it down, I'll get out of the way in just a second. Minus, n minus 1 and then omega to the minus n minus 1 squared. All right, you check this out, make sure I have it right, but I believe you'll see that if you just carry out this matrix multiplication, this row times this column gives you the component corresponding to index 0. This row times the column gives you the component corresponding to the index 1. 
this row times this column, and so on and so on. All right? It's exactly this sum. Okay? It's exactly this sum. So this is, oops. I can't write my vectors. This is this row, the Fourier transform of f, the zeroth component, the Fourier transform of f, component indexed by 1, the Fourier transform of f, the n minus first component. OK? So you can view computing the Fourier transform as a giant multiplication by a big old n by n matrix. So I could write even a little bit more dramatically. If I view the Fourier transform this way, then I might write something like the Fourier transform, the nm entry, is just omega to the minus nm. It's a nice way of remembering it, actually. It's a nice way of remembering it. OK, now, so you notice a couple things, actually. All right, you notice that it is symmetric in n and m. All right, so f is symmetric. If it's equal to its transpose, if I, if I swap m and m, I get the same answer. So f is symmetric. All right. It's also almost unitary, but not quite. All right. To, to say that it's unitary would be to consider the not just the transpose, but the conjugate transpose. All right. So f star, the adjoint of f is a conjugate transpose. All right, and the orthogonality of the discrete complex exponentials, the property coming in again in a slightly different setting or from a slightly different perspective, same property, different perspective, the orthogonality of the complex um, exponentials, the discrete complex exponentials, translates to that if I take f star times f regarded as a matrix, so I take the conjugate transpose, times the matrix F, or F times the conjugate transpose, what do you suppose I get? If it were a unitary matrix, I would just get the identity. But I don't, because the complex exponentials are not orthonormal. There's an extra factor of n in there. So it's n times i, the identity matrix. OK. So it's symmetric and it's almost unitary. This is another way of seeing, by the way, that the inverse Fourier transform This is another way of getting of getting inverse Fourier transform. That is to say, you see the inverse Fourier transform from this is going to be 1 over n times the adjoint, times the, times the um, transpose conjugate. The transpose doesn't do anything, all right? It's symmetric in n and m. So when I take the transpose, the matrix looks the same. Taking the conjugate replaces this power minus nm by the plus power, plus nm. Because taking the conjugate, remember these are powers of the complex exponential, e to the, plus two, e to the minus 2 pi i nm over capital N, and then the, the conjugate of that would be e to the plus 2 pi i n m, little n times little m times divided by capital N, all right? Which is exactly the power that you get, the kind of powers you get when you're taking the inverse Fourier transform. All right, so it's another way of getting it. Now, it also shows you one other thing. If you're going to compute the Fourier transform, how many multiplications are involved? Well, it's an n by n matrix to compute. It has n squared entries. All right, n by n matrix has n squared entries. So to compute, the Fourier transform times a vector requires n squared multiplications. And also n additions, or however many additions, but that's not important. The important thing is the uh, number of multiplications. So to compute FF requires, let's just say, n squared operations, or on the order of n squared operations. All right? Because an n by n matrix has n squared entries. Each one of those entries has to, each one of those entries comes into the computation. Okay? All right, now, and you would think you're stuck. You would think you're stuck at that. You can't do any better. 
So as I'm sure you all know, and as we'll talk about, the fast Fourier transform algorithm is a way of reducing the number of operations. Quite striking and, and maybe a little surprising. So the FFT algorithm, that's what it does. Reduces the operations to of the order n log n. All right, from n squared to n log n. Now. There is some confusion, I'm sure, not among this class, but there is some confusion in the land. Uh, if you talk to people who like, don't know what the hell they're talking about, they think the FFT is some other operation. All right? It's doing something else. It's some different transform, but it's not. Right? The FFT is an algorithm for computing the DFT. When you're computing, the when, you're computing when you go into MATLAB and whatever, the, whatever you type FFT, you are computing the discrete Fourier transform, but you are doing it by a special algorithm that reduces the number of operations, all right? But, you, but, but it's not a different transform. So when you're talking to your friends over dinner over the, about this, as I'm sure you are, make sure to correct their thinking, okay? Because people will, all, will often talk about the FFT of a signal or something like that. And that really, that kind of grates, right? Because you're not, computing, you're not computing a different kind of transform. It's not you're computing a fast transform of something. All right, you're computing the discrete Fourier transform. That's what you're computing. But you're doing it in a fast way. Okay, here ends the sermon. Now, so we'll come back to this. Actually, I'm, I'm sort of torn, to tell you the truth. Uh, so you can tell me uh, when, I've when I've done the class before. Sometimes I have, done the, I have gone through the, the, the derivation of the fast Fourier transform algorithm. Sometimes I have not. What do you want? You want to see how it goes? You want to see how it works or not? Okay, all right. Last year I didn't do it, and somebody wrote a very bitter comment on their, on their you know, course evaluation said, I took this course because I wanted to see the derivation of the fast Fourier transform algorithm, and that son of a bitch didn't do it, you know, or, or something like that, you know. So, you know, you know, I don't care what else was in the course. You know, I wanted to see the derivation of the fast Fourier transform algorithm, and he didn't do it. So, all right, so I'll do that. That will put us a little behind, all right? So I may have to cut some corners elsewhere, but, but I'll, it's, it's, it's great to see, all right? It's, you know, it's, it's really it's amazing that it works, and it's you know, fun if you like that kind of stuff. So all right, we'll do that on Monday. All right, we'll go through the FFT algorithm on Monday. All right, now let me go back to talking about some general properties of the DFT. I left off, actually, last, or rather, last time I started by saying, there's one very important property of the DFT that's different than the, than the continuous case, and we'll get to it later, and now it's later. And that's this issue of periodicity. All right? So back to, let's, let's, let's go back to general properties. Getting to know your DFT. All right? And that is that both the inputs and the outputs to the DFT really must be considered to be not just discrete signals indexed from 0 to n minus 1 or whatever you want to call the indexing, but they have, to be, they have to be considered to be periodic. That is defined on all the integers and periodic of period n. You really must consider the inputs and outputs to the DFT as periodic of period n. Periodic discrete signals of period n. So define on all the integers, not just on the integers from 0 to n minus 1, but define on all the integers and then repeating every n, every n integers. All right, periodic of period n. This actually has a number of consequences. It has theoretical consequences. It has practical consequences. But let me show you why it's true. This is so because the fundamental building block that goes into the definition of the DFT, that is this complex exponential, is itself periodic. This is so because of the periodicity of the dis this discrete complex exponential. I'll explain. All right, so take the complex exponential omega, whose mth component, once again, is e to the 2 pi i m over n. All right. Then that's. Periodic of period n, obviously capital N, because omega 
at, n plus, at m plus n is e to the 2 pi i m plus n divided by n. And you see what happens, exponentials being what they are. That's e to the 2 pi i m over n times e to the 2 pi i. N over n, capital N over n, just e to the 2 pi i. So that's, you're back to where you started. So that's e to the, that's omega m. All right? So omega m plus n, m, little m plus capital N, is omega of n. And the same thing holds for powers, and also for positive or negative powers. So likewise, omega to the k, omega to the n, plus or minus n, n can be a positive or negative integer here is also periodic. Periodic or period n. Okay. All right, so when you form the DFT, you are forming just a linear combination of these periodic signals, all of which have the same period. I mean, the higher harmonics may have, so to speak, may have a shorter period, but they have at least period n. Well, they do or not, I have to think about that, but never mind. You are forming, when you're forming the DFT, this expression, the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of fn time, never mind what the coefficients are, there could be any coefficients, omega to the minus n is also periodic of period n. All right? As a discrete signal, All right, so I should have said here, maybe I should have said this a little bit more carefully, although I think you see what's going on here. This definition, of course, makes sense for any value of m. It doesn't have to be just between 0 and capital N minus 1. So writing down this formula for the complex exponential makes sense for all integers, right? Uh, I mean, although I only initially defined the discrete complex exponential as being indexed from 0 to n minus 1, it obviously makes sense if I plug in any integer here. And if I do that, then I have a periodic signal of period capital N. All right. So interpreting capital, uh, interpreting little omega in that way, Adding up any linear combination of them like this, in particular, results in a periodic, dis periodic discrete signal. OK, so that says, in particular, the output of computing the Fourier transform results in a periodic signal. OK? You may wonder why I'm making a big deal out of this, actually, but it turns out to be quite important. All right, so say capital F the output of taking the discrete Fourier transform of a signal is periodic. So capital F is periodic. Or by, of all rights ought to be regarded as and has the fundamental inalienable property of being periodic of period n. Periodic of period n. And you better regard it that way. All right, some things don't work out if you don't regard it that way. And then, and then the same sort of reasoning applies in taking the inverse Fourier transform, all right? Same reasoning applies in taking the inverse Fourier transform, all right? The inverse Fourier transform looks like it, again, is just a combination of positive powers of the discrete complex exponential. And so it is of and ought to be, have the inalienable right of also producing a periodic discrete signal of period n. So the, Fourier trans the inverse Fourier transform of f is sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1 of fn omega to the plus n. Okay? So it's also periodic. Also produces, the right hand side that is, produces a periodic signal. of period n, okay? All right, but the, but the, if I apply the inverse Fourier transform to the Fourier transform, then that would mean that the original input should be periodic, all right? So if, again, if I start off with a signal, if I start off with anything and I apply the, inverse, I apply the Fourier transform for it, what I get out is a periodic signal, of an ought to be a periodic signal. All right, well, if I apply the same sort of thinking, same sort of reasoning, to the inverse Fourier transform, then that says the inputs that I put into the Fourier transform also ought to be periodic. All right, so the conclusion is, 
so that's also ought to really have to consider inputs to the DFT as periodic signals of period n. All right, now this is different than the, than the continuous case, all right? The continuous case, the signals are what they are, you know, and the Fourier transform is what it is. I mean, don't, not, not, never mind the, you know, it can't be time limited and band limited. Just don't, th don't think in, in those terms for just a second here. All I'm saying is, you know, the signals are what they are. You compute the Fourier transform, you compute the inverse Fourier transform, you get what you get. There's no sort of extension of those signals to be something else than, other than what you see, all right? But in the case of the DFT, you know, you're starting with some finite set of measurements. All right, you've taken a bunch of measurements. The signal is, that's all you know about the signal. And yet, when you invoke the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform discrete, Fourier transform of the inverse discrete Fourier transform, you are somehow forced to consider that signal to be extended to be periodic. All right, so the pattern that you see, the pattern that you initially measured, has to be considered as a repeating pattern. All right, and that has some consequences because, you know, maybe you didn't take enough measurements to get a really good idea of what that pattern is. I mean, maybe if you, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this next time. But all I'm saying is that there's some, there's some consequences here in the discrete case that you don't see in the continuous case. All right? You know, you, you, you take a, a slice of that, of, of a set of, you take a set of measurements based on a slice of some continuous phenomenon that you're measuring, say. All right? You have, a, you have a discrete set of measurements. And then once you start applying Fourier transform techniques to that set of measurements, you are forcing periodicity there where it was not necessarily there when you started. All right? The original phenomenon may, not, may have had no periodicity involved in it at all. But by taking a finite set of measurements and by using the Fourier transform, turning the crank, trying to analyze it with the Fourier transform, you are sort of forcing periodicity. All right? And that, again, that, that has some consequences. That might have some consequences. So that's, that's, a, that's actually an important practical point. Now, we are not going to get into this. If you take a course on digital filtering, they'll talk a lot about these, these sorts of things. Or if you look on more specialized books on the discrete Fourier transform, they'll talk a lot about just this sort of issue, all right? And again, it, it sort of would, it's, it's very interesting and, it, and, it, and it's very important, but it would take us a little bit too far afield. But that's exactly what, what comes up. It's forcing, I mean, that's the issue. It, for, it forces periodicity into a situation where periodicity really might not be present, okay? All right, so that's one thing. The, 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 very, the simple practical consequence of this is you don't have to worry about the indexing, all right? So let me get back to this issue of how the Fourier transform is defined and how it's indexed. So that's sort of a simple, let me write it over here, a simple but helpful consequence of this periodicity simple but helpful consequence is, let me call it independence of indexing. All right, so once again, we defined the Fourier transform in a certain way. We had to, we had to start someplace, all right? So we defined the Fourier transform like so. Fourier transform of f is sum from n equals zero to n minus one of fn omega to the minus n. All right, so the vectors, both the inputs and the outputs are indexed from 0 to n minus 1, which already seems awkward because nobody indexes vectors from 0. Everybody indexes vectors from 1 to n instead of 0 to n minus 1. What are you, a jerk? You know, but nevertheless, that was the natural choice at the time, all right? But the fact is, now, this is analogous to the, to the, to the case of the, of the Fourier series, actually. Or when you compute the Fourier coefficients, if you know the function on a period, you know it everywhere, all right? So, in fact, because of periodicity, and I won't, I won't go through this in detail, let me just write it down. It's, discussing, it's a little bit awkward to actually prove these things a little bit uh, carefully. So, but because of periodicity, you can use any consecutive n numbers as an index, all right? That is to say, you can index, you don't have to index from 0 to n minus 1, you can index from 1 to n. And you can write the definition that way. All right, you can write the 
you can write the Fourier transform of f at n is equal to the sum from uh, Fourier transform of f is equal to the sum from n equals one to capital N of f n omega to the n. All right. Now, basically, you know, what, again, what is the big deal here? Well, remember, so in this sense, capital F of or little f of n of capital N is the same as little f of zero. All right. So where before it was the zeroth term, now it's the last term, but it comes up because omega to the capital N is one and omega to the zero is one and so on. So it all it all works out. Okay. It's the same thing. You can also use negative indexing. All right. This is a very common convention. If you go to different software packages, you will find, and you have to know this actually, you will find different conventions for how the Fourier trans, the discrete Fourier transform is implemented. I mean, never mind the FFT algorithms. I'm just talking about how the discrete, how, what they're thinking of as the discrete Fourier transform and how it's implemented. Sometimes they index from zero to n minus one. Sometimes they index from one to n, and you have to know that sometimes in how you enter your signals. All right. Another very common convention is, well, now, if I'm allowing my signals to be defined on all the integers, I can also consider negative frequencies, negative values for n. Whereas when you consider vectors, you don't usually consider them being indexed with negative numbers. You don't usually consider the minus first component of a vector, the minus second component of a vector, and so on and so on. But if you think of it in terms of discrete signals, that's all you're doing. You're, you're having, the signals are defined on all integers. So likewise, you can consider f of n for n negative. So f minus 1, f minus 2. And what is f? f minus 1 is just f of n minus 1. If two things differ by n, then, they're, then, f, is, then f is equal to them. It's by periodicity. f of minus 2 is f of n minus 2, and so on. All right, so again, you wouldn't necessarily consider indexing your vectors uh, with negative numbers, but it can be done as far as the definition of the Fourier transform goes. And you can write down a corresponding definition, and this is another very common convention. So you can write So if n is even, you have the Fourier transform of f is the sum from n is equal to minus n over 2 plus 1 up to n over 2 of fn omega to the minus. The same formula. It's always the same definition. I mean, it's always the same quantities that appear in, the define, in, in how it's defined. It's just a question of how they're indexed. And if n, is not, if n is not even, there's a corresponding version of this. I'll let you sort that out. All right? This is also a very common convention for how Fourier transforms are defined and indexed and so on. This is especially common, actually. This and, I, and the two-dimensional case is common because it sort of puts the origin in the middle of the, frequ in the, middle of the, of the, of the spectrum. All right? Whereas before, if you index from 0 to n minus 1, you know, you're starting at the 0th component and you're moving out. Here, this puts 0 in the middle. All right? That is, the frequency start out f minus n over 2 plus 1, f of 0, and then continuing up to f n over 2, all right? So it puts the zeroth component in the middle, in the middle of the spectrum. And again, so, you know, if we, if I had, see, if I had drawn the pictures of the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, I would have drawn them in a way that looked odd given our experience with the continuous Fourier transform. Because the continuous Fourier transform, we always consider the symmetry relation, f of f, you know, on, on plus s and minus s and so on. And I couldn't do that so easily when I only allowed myself to index from 0 to n minus 1. But if you realize that everything has to be extended to be periodic, then, you, then the indexing doesn't matter. And you can make it look even more like the continuous case. All right. I'm only saying this again. You may think, why is you know, what is it? Well, this is, seems a little bit much, much said about not very little. But all I'm saying is that it can be confusing when you look at different, for instance, different software packages and different implementations because the index they don't agree on how they index, and you have to know that, and you have to know that you're not getting yourself in trouble with, with whatever you do. All right. So let me give you one other consequence of this, nice simple consequence, and that's um, duality. All right. Once you have once you've allowed yourself to extend the functions to be periodic, then it's very easy to define the reverse signal and recover all the duality results. And actually, let me leave that up there.
That's the way the notes actually go through and recover the, and, and discover the definition of the uh, discrete Fourier, the inverse Fourier transform. It's kind of nice. It was done actually by pursuing duality and taking that over the, from the continuous case to the discrete case. And as much as I like that presentation, because I wrote it after all, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it takes a little bit longer. All right. So, but now you can you can now introduce easily reverse signals and formulate du duality. So for example, the reverse signal is just as it is in the continuous case. The reverse signal is f of minus n, all right? Which makes sense because f is now considered to be defined on all the integers and to be periodic at period n. Okay, so that makes that now makes perfect sense. It's the easiest way of doing it. There are actually ways of getting around it, even if you don't talk about periodicity, but it's it's awkward. This is very natural. And now you have quite easily you find, then we'll quit. So I'm going to show you yet one more occurrence of the troublesome factor capital N. Then you find, for example, that the Fourier transform of the reverse signal, the discrete Fourier transform, is the Fourier transform of F reversed. Same thing, same duality formula. All right? Same duality formula. The inverse Fourier transform comes in into this also in duality, but it comes in with this extra factor. And so where that comes in is if I take the Fourier transform, one way of seeing it, is if I take the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform, I don't just get back F reversed. No, 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 that would be too simple. I get back N times F reversed. Okay? That is the, that's the way the duality looks for the, dis for the discrete case. This is the same as the continuous case. This is not the same as the continuous case because anything that involves an inverse Fourier transform, you have to sort of say to yourself, anything that involves an inverse Fourier transform is likely to involve this extra irritating factor. We're also going to see that when we talk about convolution next time. All right. All right, I'll wrap it up with that. Then on Monday, uh, I'll do a little bit more of general properties, although not so much. I'll let you read those. I, I do want to just mention convolution, and then we'll do the FFT algorithm. Okay, that's the deal.